First question I have is, um, I'm one of the few people, well, not one of the few, one of the people who don't know you as the Second Life guy, but actually is the Indonesia guy and, and your great work, The Gay Archipelago. Now, I, just, I was wondering, like, for me, Indonesia was really, I felt like an outsider there doing that research. And I'm wondering if you felt like going from Indonesia to researching on Second Life, a, a move from outsider to insider, or whether that is even relevant to your practice as an anthropologist, that distinction? I mean, a little bit, although, you know, it's so funny, just because I'm gay, a lot of, you know, the Indonesian gay and lesbian and, and warrior folks that I, I've worked with in Indonesia were sort of insistent that I wasn't that different from them. And, you know, I sort of want to take that seriously just because there's such a tendency to assume exotic difference. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of times my, my gay Indonesian colleagues and interlocutors were, you know, pretty insistent that, you know, there's a lot of difference in Indonesia between Java and Sumatra and, and Sulawesi and Bali and then between Java and California. And so, you know, I was different in some ways and similar in some ways. And so, you know, just because of the nature of my my research in Indonesia and being openly gay there, they, you know, it, they, it, obviously there was some difference. But, you know, I experience difference every day in the United States. So um, in a certain sense, that was not such a huge, and that was part of what my, my Indonesia research was about in some ways, was challenging that, that I, those ideas around difference. Certainly in Second Life, you know, in any kind of digital research, that can work differently. And particularly because when I, I started work in Second Life, you know, which is in 2003, so that's, you know, 16 years ago. Right. If you look at my avatar, I was born on June 3rd, 2004. When I started in Second Life that long ago, there were only about 2,000 people, and I never mm. knew if it would get any bigger. And so I definitely am sort of an old-timer in Second Life in a certain sense, but, you know, mm. there's people who spend a lot more time than I do. But um, So in, in some ways, but it actually wasn't that big of a, of a difference, I think just because of the... the the nature of the research that I've, I've done in Indonesia where I've been very interested in modernity and very interested in technology and very interested in sort of new identities and, and all that kind of thing. Um, that the, the difference in some ways is more degree than kind. It, it was not yeah. as different as I was thinking it would be. Yeah, I feel kind of a little bit naive actually setting up the question in terms of insider and outsider. It doesn't, I mean, uh, in terms of research, we had uh, Joel Kahn used to be teaching in my department at La Trobe, and a lot of his work was about how we all share a modernity. And it was sort of, when I think about it, it really challenges the typical sort of version of anthropology we teach our first years, which is there's inside anthropology and then there's sort of the, the more traditional anthropology of the outsider. But I wonder if it's such a useful tool to think about. I mean, what, from what you're saying to me, it seems not so much, actually. Yeah, I mean... And just thinking about the history of anthropology or, you know, teaching it to our students as well, and thinking of even of the work of people like Marty Bunzel, that insider versus outsider in some ways is sort of a British-French versus, you know, american Boazian approach, where in the, in the American tradition, that the, the kind of uh, outsider being necessary for objectivity was not really there and so you had Robert Lowy writing a book about the Germans, you know, in 1916 or whatever. Nora Zeal Hurston studying African Americans, or Ella Deloria studying Native Americans. I mean, you had, you, you really didn't have that idea that knowledge production is predicated on a difference between the researcher and the researched. Um, yeah, that really was uh, um, much stronger in the British tradition, which obviously influences the Australian thought. But yeah. Long in the American tradition. Uh, you know, I have a hard time justifying what I'm doing and it, to other people who are, for example, um, techies, experts in digital technologies. What would you say to people like that who sort of roll their eyes when uh, you might mention you're doing anthropology, digital cultures or virtual worlds? I mean, I don't really have that reaction and I do a lot of consulting for tech you know, companies, I've, I've consulted from Microsoft and Intel and other kinds of places that are very interested in it. I mean, I guess I'd have two responses. One is there's a pretty broad understanding that this technology is only existing in the sense of people using the technology, even when there's machine learning and AI involved. It's about 
human social interaction in these spaces and that many of the biggest challenges we face, whether that be surveillance and privacy or harassment, but also, you know, constructive behavior online and new forms of work or whatever, all of that is as much about forms of human social interaction as it is about the technology and that mm. we've learned the hard way that trying to do just a technological fix basically doesn't work. And so understanding what is happening in terms of human social interaction in terms of these digital cultures is, is very important. And so, and, and, and a lot of tech companies obviously really understand that and, and they have a lot of social scientists, including anthropologists, doing work for them. Mm. I mean, part of the danger in terms of the rolling eyes where I could sympathize is, you know, compared to Indonesia where I had to learn the Indonesian language and, and devote, you know, a long time to going along halfway around the world and doing the research, uh, the pleasure of doing research in Second Life, one of the pleasures is I could log in from my home in California and immediately be here. Right. Uh, but the danger of that is that you do unfortunately have a uh, fairly significant number of people going into these virtual worlds, not just like a life, but other ones as well, and claiming that they are, are quote unquote, doing anthropology when they don't have solid methods, they don't have any training, they don't have human subjects clearance. They're mm. just going in for a weekend and talking about themselves and calling it autoethnography or something. Right. And, you know, a, a constant issue I face is that when I do, you know, encounter people who are dismissive of ethnography or don't see its value, what they're often pointing to is people who have no background or training in ethnographic research who just say, oh, I'm an autoethnographer because I spend time in World of Warcraft and talk to my friends. So that's ethnography. And so that. Right. That is a real um, issue in that, you know, I don't want to be a gatekeeper in a, in a negative sense of I want lots of people to be interested in doing this kind of work, but mm. I do want to be a gatekeeper in the sense that any form of research requires training and methods, and a danger of the ease of accessibility of these spaces is people pos posing, basically, as as researchers when they, they don't have that, and, and real ethical issues I've encountered for you know, in cases of folks who don't have any kind of human subjects clearance or even understanding of research ethics who, you know, deceive people, play tricks on people and think that is uh, appropriate for for research and that really, you know, damages, poisons the well for future people who are actually doing research but also can sort of contribute to that, that eye-rolling, you know, kind yeah. of thing. So that, may, that might be part of what you've encountered is sure. that, um, you know, when people roll their eyes, if I say, well, what specific examples of research are you talking about? Yeah. It's usually not coming of age in Second Life. Or, you know, it's not usually, it's usually people who are blogging about their life in Second Life and, and claiming that it's research or whatever. And, mm. you know, unfortunately that, that does exist. But by no means limited to Second Life. That happens to Facebook or Twitter or, you know, Fortnite or, or Minecraft or, or whatever. It's not by no means unique to Second Life. It's just the, the downside of the accessibility of virtual places is that you know anyone can come in and say that they're a researcher. If you're trying to explain this to like a, a high school leaver, well, how would you explain it to them, the methods and training of an anthropologist? I mean, they're really not that different for physical world or virtual world, you know, environments that a core method is participant observation, of, mm -hmm. you know, spending time in a community so that you get to know the difference between what people say they do and what they're actually doing. Yeah. And that that takes time and building trust. It's like learning a language, you know, as Renato Rosaldo said, there's no shortcuts. It's, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, in many ways, it's like learning another culture is like learning another language. And mm. you can become fluent in, an, in another language. That doesn't mean it becomes your mother tongue. That it means you know a lot more than you did before you started. And the point is to get more fluent, so to speak. Sure. Um, it's not for it to become your mother tongue. And so, you know, participant observation to me is the fundamental thing. And then, you know, interviews and focus groups are really valuable. Historical and archival work is really valuable. Sometimes surveys can be helpful. I mean... You know, there's some kinds of funky methods that people will sometimes use, myself included, but the, the sort of core, you know, methods of participant observation and, and interviews and archival work are, are really the core of what I've ever seen is really good 
anthropological work. And mm -hmm. the point is that participant observation in particular, but even interviews, all those things are really customized to the field site. So when I do participant observation you know, with gay men in a park in Surabaya in Indonesia, mm -hmm. um, it looks pretty different than talking to you right here because the whole mm -hmm. point is that you sort of meet people where they're at, you meet the culture where it's at, and you, 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 you know, customize that, that method to the field site. Uh, first, I was just fascinated to hear you were doing some work with Microsoft and Intel. Can you give me a brief rundown of what that was? Um, yeah, I mean, over the years, I, there have been various cases where I've been, you know, invited to do um, consulting work for those Oops, consulting work for those companies. And, you know, we have graduate students or folks who end up working full-time in those uh, companies and do really interesting work. In, in my case, you know, the consulting work has been around things of like, you know, what is, how exactly is social interaction working in these virtual worlds so that a company like Intel can figure out, like, what kinds of chips do they need to develop? Does it need to emphasize graphics capabilities? Does it need to emphasize the ability to have a lot of avatars in one place, mm. you know, that kind of thing. And so that's the kind of thing often that, that a company like, like, uh, like Microsoft or Intel is, is interested in. And, you know, we have, you know, graduate students from, from our department or you know, many other departments who end up working full time in those, in those companies. And that's something that, you know, if we want to talk about anthropology as being, relevant to the world, then we really need to support the idea that anthropologists aren't just um, in anthropology departments or in the academy. That's, that's wonderful, but they also can be out there in the world, in, you know, corporate environments, nonprofit government environments, and, you know, many other disciplines like economics or chemistry or physics have a much more, you know, are much more familiar with that kind of idea of people moving in sort of academic and outside of academic spaces. Um, but that's really, you know, important for anthropology as well, for justifying its existence and, and sort of spreading the good things that anthropology can, can do. And so, you know, some, you know, in my own case, it's only been sort of short-term kinds of consulting things because I just don't have time to do anything um, longer. But, you know, there a lot of these companies are interested in hiring anthropologists or those kinds of folks not just like sort of the psychology kinds of folks, because they see that um, what they really want to better understand is the social interaction between people, not just individual psychology kinds of issues, but sort of collectivities and what are the new kinds of collectivities that are forming online. I've been using the term digital community. Uh, uh, I know you're a bit uncomfortable from your from the Second Life book about the term digital, um, but how does digital community sit with you? as a way to understand something like uh, Second Life? Oh, it's, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's fine. I've actually, I mean, in some of my later work, if you look at the stuff I've done in the Rethinking Digital Anthropology book and some other kinds of things, that there's, you know, d digital, I'm, I'm fine with the idea of digital community, basically. And mm -hmm. also, for me, because uh, I have a linguistics background, um, languages need synonyms. All languages have synonyms or else life gets really boring. And so in a lot of my writing, I treat digital and virtual and cyber as basically meaning the same thing because that's really important and <laughs> to have synonyms. And I actually use digital a lot more nowadays because I think about what's really interesting about virtual environments is the sort of ones and zeros of digital uh, the way digital computing works gives you a way to think about this sort of relationship between the online and offline that it's not about blurring, but about forms of interaction and overlay that like, you know, right now we're in a digital space and that's very different from a physical space, but they influence each other. That's why we're sitting on sofas, and why we have heads and arms and that kind of thing. But they, they do different kinds of things. And, and, and in the same way, collectivity and community are basically synonyms. You know, I don't think we need to have angels dancing at the head of a pin about the differences <laughs> okay. between them. I mean, there, there are cases, there's cases where sometimes you want really careful terminological precision and you might be talking about the difference between a sociality community and a collectivity or whatever. But also, you know, for me, just as, as a writer, as well as a, as a researcher, you have to have synonyms in language, it's just something that all languages have. And 
for me, just in English, the, you know, collectivity and community are, are basically the same kind of thing. I mean, community is an interesting term. It's been very hard to define. It's in its original meaning from people like Robert Redfield, it really meant a kind of physical co-location on like a shared grocery store and post office and church. And it meant sort of shared neighborhood kinds of institutions. But then going all the way back to the eighties, really, it then eventually took on a different meaning where you would talk about things like the gay community or the Asian American community, where it meant sort of the aggregate of individuals who share an identity. So the Asian American community could mean a group of people that may not share a post office or a church or a bar or the same kind of thing as a gay community. So there's been sort of mission creep, so to speak, in terms of the definition of community, where it started around a sense of physical co-location and shared institutions to meaning kind of a shared identity, regardless of where you are in the world. And then what's been interesting is in some uses of virtual community or digital community, in some cases, has actually sort of gone back to the earlier meaning in the sense that it doesn't necessarily mean people that share an identity, but that they're online in the same place. So it's mm -hmm. sort of interesting how some uses of virtual or digital community actually hark back to some of the earlier definitions where it's not that we share an identity, but that we're in the same place in Second Life, right? Or that we're, you know, part of a guild in World of Warcraft or, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. So sure. it's sort of interesting, um, you know, that way. But the, the general take-home point is just, if we want to understand what's happening online, in, you know, in the broadest sense, mm -hmm. it's not just about individual tastes and preferences it's not just about individual identities and tweets and Facebook postings or whatever. It's about networks, communities, collectivities, socialities, guilds, you know, whatever, all these kinds of collective trans individual sort of things. Mm -hmm. And those are really interesting because in some ways they, they reflect or look a lot like forms of national local community identity kinds of stuff that we see in the physical world and in some cases in some ways in some cases they look really different and so that piece of it and you know for social for anthropologists um is something that obviously we're, we're really interested in right so um in coming of age I, I got a sense that you felt there wasn't too much difference between let's say offline and online community in as much as it's always mediated through things like uh, culture and language but um, am I picking up from you that, that you, you, you actually feel that there are some peculiarities or unique features about online social interaction? I mean, yes, in a way. Part of it is that there's such a tendency with new technologies to assume that everything is different. And a lot is not. A lot is carried over from the history of what was there before, which explains how millions of people can do it in the first place, right? Mm. So that it's not an issue of a complete radical break, right? That there are a lot of commonalities. And then there are some differences. Some of those are very specific to particular things, like Facebook versus Twitter versus email versus life or whatever. Some of them are more um, general. So, um, you know, there, there are really interesting differences and really interesting similarities, but it's not, it's not the case that everything is, is completely new. And that in, if you look at the history of technology, if you look at the telephone and the radio and the telegraph and the invention of the book and the printing press, if you look at the history of technology, you, you find throughout that it's influenced by the history of what came before. It's never just invented out of whole cloth. That history really has an influence. Um, the influence is not total, but there is that, that influence. And so... Um, you know, the fact that I could have any kind of body or gender I want in the virtual world, that is interesting. That has sort of interesting consequences. The fact that we can be sitting in the same um, room physically, even though we're in different, you know, continents, that's a really interesting uh, effect of virtual, you know, environments. One of them is interesting. You know, as I say in my Second Life book, there's a way that time can't be virtualized in the way that space can, so that we're sitting 
together in my room right now, but there's no way I can have it be 9.30 p.m. for you right now the way it is for me, right? Like, right. I can't virtualize time in the same way, yeah. um, which is has a lot of really interesting consequences. So, you yeah. know, there are really interesting differences, but also there's really interesting differences between California and Indonesia. There's really interesting differences between the UK and Australia. So the mm -hmm. fact that different social environments differ didn't start with going online, <laughs> you know? And so, and so once again, the idea that different kinds of social, you know, contexts have different implications shouldn't be a big shock because we see that already. If you look at Japan versus Italy or, you know, or whatever, you right. see differences, you know, already in that, that sense. And so, um, in the same way, there are really interesting differences when you look at virtual worlds and virtual environments, but it's not like 100% different, you know, you don't have much background in Second Life, and we had a little issue with the Frozen thing or whatever, but now, like, we're here, and we're talking, and it's working, and, like, the fact that's possible is because a lot of what's happening is actually building on things that we've learned from the physical world, right? How, how is it different or the same having an avatar on Second Life? From your perspective yeah well there's two pieces to that that I've, I've written about um, a lot already and so one is the issue of um, how can you know what does it mean when you can change the, the, the issue of changing the body right mm -hmm. so that we can change clothes in the physical world but it's, you know, in Second Life, I could look like a refrigerator if I wanted to right now. <laughs> or or I could, you know, do whatever. I can change my avatar embodiment. And, you know, the work I've done with disability, mm. you know, people who are amputees can have two arms if they went to here. You know, mm. what, what are the implications of that? Or someone who's 90 years old can look like they're 25. What are the implications of that? Mm. So there's the issue around changeability of the body, which in the physical world is, is really hard to um, do, obviously. Um, to change your race or gender or age in the physical world is impossible or very, very difficult, and you can't change it back 45 minutes later, right? So right. there's that whole side of things. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, something else I've been very interested in that you really get from virtual worlds and that leaks back to sort of phenomenology is the issue that embodiment is always in placement, that bodies mm. are always in places, and mm. that the place-making aspect of virtual worlds is actually very, very important to understanding the body. So, you know, I'll put it in type, but when people are like in Second Life, they talk about being in world, I and mean, that's a term that's, that's used, mm. and so sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of playing off of Heidegger, instead of being in the world, I've talked mm. about sort of being in world as a kind of phenomenology, right? Because yes, yes. what's interesting around phenomenology is that it is actually very much about dwelling and being in a place. Right. And what's so interesting in virtual worlds is that um, what's going on here is in placement just as much as embodiment. It's not being in a place. But mm. to me, the really cool, important stuff around virtual worlds actually isn't about the avatars narrowly construed. It's actually about placemaking and places, like this house, um, yeah. you know, going to different places in Second Life. And that's something that you see as well in things like Fortnite or Minecraft, um, you know, or Warcraft, it's, you know, any of these kinds of online places, even when you look at esports, right, or all those kinds of things. The, the, the fact of the avatar is not what makes esports possible. It's the fact that there is an arena, that there is a field. In, mm -hmm. in the same way as in the physical world, to play a game of soccer or rugby or whatever, it is not enough to put on a uniform. You have to have a soccer field. You have right. to have a, 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 a stadium, a mm. place to play. Right. That is actually the fundamental requirement. And so, in terms of phenomenology, what I think is so fascinating around virtual worlds is the stuff around place and, and placemaking and the link between that and the body. I'm also very interested in Indonesia. I've been so concerned with what's going on with the LGBT, I think that's what they're calling it in Indonesia at the moment, debate. What, what are your feelings and your analysis on what's going on at the moment? I mean, we're talk what I'm mentioning is things like canings, vitriol on the internet about LGBT and this kind of thing. 
Yeah, I, I actually have, you know, another article about that coming out in a couple months. Um, and I'm really tired of writing those kinds of articles, but I have one coming out about digital exclusionary populism. It's been so incredibly horrible to the, the queer communities there. And, you know, I've traced out what's happened and many other people have as well. And, um, you know, for years, because I, I started going to Indonesia in 1992, oh, really? for years yeah. I always... No, oh, yeah, and I've, I, my, my, you know, track, my history in Indonesia goes way back. Well, how did you get there so I've early? Said, i got to ask, were, were you a high school student there or something? No, no, I was doing sort of international consulting for HIV AIDS organizations oh, nice. and I activist right. work and I, I was in Russia and Malaysia and then went to Indonesia and just got really close to groups there. So oh, I was... Right. 23 the first, that you know that first time okay. I went. so I was out of college all right so I, I digress but, um, there I digress um, no, 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 yeah. it's fine. But, um, but you know since the 1990s I've been talking about how there's no logical reason why LGBT Indonesians couldn't be a convenient political football in the sort of battles between the left and the right in Indonesia, they in some ways were just not well known enough yet to sort of work that way, like communists or environmentalists or, you know, feminists could be. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's, there, it, the, the legalization of gay marriage around the world, including in the U.S. in 2008, had a huge impact in Indonesia and many other parts of the world because it made sort of queer stuff visible in a way that it hadn't been before as thinkable thing that could lead to social inclusion. And so that was a really big event, you know, even in, in places like Indonesia. And then, you know, there are, there's been this globalization of anti, you know, queer rhetoric, its own kind of alternative globalization that's been happening. And in Indonesia with the sort of Islamic right, um, you know, the sort of Saudi Arabian influence and other, you know, um, Islamic right that LGBT has turned into its own weird word, right? And people mm. don't even know what the letters mean, sort of like what AIDS is too. LGBT yeah. has become this new um, term without people even really knowing what it um, what it means. Mm. But that's absolutely beneficial because then it makes it easy to sort of portray it as something from the outside, right? Something that's not authentically Indonesian. Yeah. And the way in which, you know, going back to the anti-pornography laws and all that kind of stuff, it has become a sort of um, convenient political football. And, mm. you know, what's been so difficult in Indonesia is that you have a very small minority of really right-wing folks who spread this hate online and off. And what's been difficult in Indonesia, like many parts of the world, is that you have a big majority of people who are, are basically tolerant, but not informed or invested enough to actually really stand up and say this is wrong mm. right and mm. so there has not been a strong enough you know pushback in that way and obviously the dodo has been a huge disappointment in that way you know going right. all the way up to the, the highest levels of the government of right. people who would not themselves be violent or horrible towards lgbt folks but who just aren't motivated to actually you know take a stand and say you know i'm an ally that's not okay and mm. as we see with minorities around the world, including LGBT minorities, it's really hard if you don't have allies, um, especially with a kind of LGBT thing where so many people are closeted, it makes mm. the group seem even smaller, right? And, right? and it makes sort of warrior trans people more vulnerable because they're so visible. Um, and so, you know, the struggle in Indonesia nowadays is, you know, will the the moral majority stand up, you know, yeah. will the, the sort of democratic majority stand up to this, you know, right wing minority that's sort of fueled by internet kinds of networks to appear bigger than it really is. And there's been some encouraging signs, but there, there have been a lot of discouraging signs as well. And that's by no means, you know, unique to Indonesia. It's absolutely not unique to Islam. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we have to name the fact that there is right, a right-wing Islamic school of thought that has been very unhelpful and hateful. Um, but there's also so many Islamic scholars that are really supportive. And there's plenty mm -hmm. of Christian and Hindu right-wing religious figures that have been hateful. So it's not about Islam per se. Right. Um, 
and uh, you know the question is sort of what will, will happen moving forward in that that sense and in Indonesia that's obviously tied up to a bigger debate about the sort of future of multiculturalism in Indonesia and the whole sort of unity and diversity ideals of Indonesia um, you know is it a place for whole archipelago and all of its diversity or is it you know, going to be, uh, you know, that certain people are first-class citizens and the others aren't. So mm-hmm. it's a, you know, it's it's a very unresolved and stressful <laughs> kind of thing. But it's yeah. been really hard for a lot of my colleagues and friends in Indonesia who've, um, you know, had to go underground or partially underground. I mean, even these things like banning gay apps or, you know, these other kinds of things, um, you know, has a huge effect, and it's so hard for people to find places to, to meet. Uh, you know, not everyone lives in a city that has a place to hang out at night, and not everyone who lives in those cities can go hang out at night, particularly if they're women, you know, or if they have kids or whatever. And so um, it's, yeah, it's really a, a stressful, upsetting situation. It's worse for LGBT people in Indonesia right now than it has been for 300 years. 50 years, right? Yeah, right. This is the worst it's ever been. Correct. And so, and that's that's really upsetting when you think that things are going to be getting better and and progressing in terms of social justice around the world, and they don't. And so, um, it's, you know, I don't have a simple, simple answer to that. And, you know, global networks and global pressure can do its part, but obviously a lot of it has to come from within the country and a lot of this is linked up to the question of you know religious minorities ethnic minorities gender equality it's it's obviously not just about lgbt folks but because yeah. they are you know um, don't have a lot of, of, of cultural capital a lot of social power in indonesia they're an easy target right right well, there's two questions i want to ask firstly about um your role on American Anthropologist, you were editor-in-chief, or at least an editor, um, and also I wanted to talk about your next project. Briefly, what was what was or is your role, and from your experiences there, where do you think anthropology is at? Yeah, I, I was editor-in-chief of American Anthropologist for five years, um, and so that's sort of the highest editorial position that you can have in the American Anthropological Association, and it was a great experience, and I really learned a lot from doing it. Um, and I think what you, at least from that kind of position, because I was, you know, publishing work in archaeology, biological anthropology, linguistic anthropology, you know, a huge range of work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to me, the take home point from that experience was that there's not one conversation or not one direction in which anthropology is going. There's a lot of really exciting research communities and we want to, to nurture and support those and that there's, there's really amazing work in legal anthropology and medical anthropology and there's really great work in the anthropology of China and, you know, the anthropology of Latin America or whatever mm. and that, you know, for a big journal like that, I would work with authors to write articles in a way that would speak to a general anthropology audience but to not be something that they're not and that, you know, the real contribution of the work is to their own research community of, you know, that more sort of focused kind of space that they are in Mm -hmm. and that other people can absolutely get excited by that work and learn about that work, that it really in that sense is an interdisciplinary space, even though it's the discipline of anthropology. It's really an interdisciplinary space. And I think that's similar for sociology or psychology or history or so many disciplines that, you know, they're really big spaces. And, um, in, you know, the, that American Anthropologist, the journal that I was editor of, has been publishing for over 100 years. And I think if you look at the history of the journal, what's been less effective over the 100 years have been cases where there's been a kind of ideology that every article needs to speak across all sub-disciplines and to everyone. Yeah. Um, because I just don't think that's realistic and I don't think that's a way to do the most exciting work. And so I, I would think of it, I thought of American Anthropologist more like the journal Science or something like that, where you want to publish the best of every conversation that's out there. And that's how you get people excited to learn about something new. Someone who doesn't work in Africa to say, wow, this is some of the cool new work about Africa. Let's check this out. This gets me really excited. 
and not that that work has to directly be speaking to my research in Europe or Latin America because it's just not realistic, but that it is cutting edge work in this space and through that I can sort of get excited about it. So I would work with with authors to you know take a little time to define terms maybe that were really specific only to archaeology or only to Mayan archaeology or only to the anthropology of Eastern Europe or whatever. Let's right. take a little time to explain to the general reader what does this term mean? But beyond that, to really leave people alone to do their best work in their own space, their own research community is what I mean. Yeah. And that's the way to get you know, people in other spaces really interested in that, in, in my experience. And so you know, there are, of course, many, many journals that are smaller, more or topically focused journals. And that's a very different kind of space where you can sort of have more overlap between the articles, so to speak, because it's the Journal of Political and Legal Anthropology or it's the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies or something like that. Right. But I, I think there's a real value in the generalist journals like Social Anthropology or Ethnos or Current Anthropology or, or Asian Pacific Journal of Anthropology, you know, that kind of thing, American anthropologists. I think there's a real value in those general, generalist journals that really bring together work from really different parts of the world and, and really different topics. There's something really um, stimulating and fun about putting together work from a whole bunch of different perspectives and not forcing it to try and speak to everyone, but letting the sparks fly from putting all that good work together in one place. And then I think it's also really valuable to have journals that focus on Southeast Asia or focus on medical anthropology or, you know, focus on one area, those journals have their own purpose. And, and that's really awesome too, right? So it's not either or. Um, they, they all have value. Your next project, I know you're busy working on a monograph right now, is that right? Yeah, I'm working on two books uh, right now and and then we'll eventually move on to a, a third big new new research project. But I sort of, from this, this work um, and also just becoming really interested in history, I'm doing a, what's called a platform studies book with a colleague right now, um, which is a study of the Intellivision video game system from the 1980s, um, which was the the main competitor to Atari back in that, that day and was a, a groundbreaking system in a whole bunch of different ways. And it's just been it's such uh, a pleasure to be doing this research and sort of fun to be a historian. Um, and uh, the company was actually based in the Los Angeles area, which is where I live. And so many of the programmers and uh, and executives involved with the, the company are still alive in the area. And so I've been able to do a lot of oral history work. And um, I, I'm just thrilled about this this book, uh, which try, my colleague and I are trying to finish it by the end of October. And um, I think, you know, the idea of a platform studies kind of approach is that you're looking at technology in terms of the social relationships, the economic relationships, but also how does the chip work? How does the programming work? Um, and so you're sort of looking at it in all of its different dimensions. And so I'm learning about the computer coding that was happening in the 1980s about, you know, nowadays when we talk about bits and bytes, we all talk about how eight bits makes a byte, and mm -hmm. then you have megabytes and gigabytes. Um, but the Intellivision system was almost completely unique in that for it, 10 bits made a decal. So it was not based on an 8-bit system. It was actually based on a 10-bit system, which doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And just to learn about what did that 10-bit system do that an 8-bit system did not, um, is that even just that kind of simple thing is, is really interesting uh, to think about the, the legacies of that, that history. And, and in television, as its name suggests, in some ways was playing around with ideas of artificial intelligence before its time and sort of trying to think about what would intelligence look like in sort of gaming um, in a time between 1979 and, and 1984 where you had no internet, where the game cartridges were 4K in size. So you had yeah. very little space, so the programmers had to be very, very, you know, um, careful in terms of what they could fit in a, in a, in a program. So that's the... Um, that's that that project, and then um, you know I just 
last year finished uh, uh, more than five years of doing research in Second Life on disability in virtual worlds. And we did a, a film, uh, a documentary film about it. We did a, a whole bunch of research and interviews with a, a, a different colleague and I. And I um, have a couple articles that have come out about that research, but I'm going to do a book um, about that, that research. And that included that we had two islands in Second Life that we gave land for disabled folks to build on. And so I talk about that in the project and, and just sort of thinking more broadly about what disability experience um, online uh, teaches us about the human condition online. So uh, I'm going to uh, do that book, um, which is partially written now, but once I get the, the Intellivision book done, I, I'll finish up that book. And then after that, I'm going to be doing a new set of research projects that are probably going to be around the stuff I'm calling artificial cultures, about really looking more carefully as an anthropologist at, at artificial intelligence and machine learning and all that stuff about the basic idea being, you know, what does it mean moving forward where when we're in a sort of human uh, social interaction of a group of people interacting, you know, in the future, those environments will almost always be including some AI elements, in mm. them, whether that be a smartphone or an autonomous car or a home um, or a device or whatever it is, um, just as, you know, human culture has always been a multi-species project. If you think about animals and domesticated animals in the environment and right. you know, dogs and cows and all that kind of right. stuff, but now the nature of the non-human is shifting, that it's also going to be including AI um, what does that mean for the concept of culture um, mm. and the concept of the human when the the act, social actors in a human culture are including AI agents of various kinds? Um, mm. What's up with that? What are the different forms that can take? Uh, what's at stake? What are the consequences? And so once I get these two books done, that's sort of my next goal is to sort of do some research projects looking at that, some in virtual environments like this one, some in physical world environments, and I'll, I'll figure that out when I when I get to it. But it's a, it's a really interesting area that there's already a bunch of people doing really interesting work on, and it's an area where I think um, anthropology can have a lot to offer, and so we should, we should be active in that stuff. Well, it does really sound fascinating. I'm really looking forward to reading about all this stuff. Um... Thanks. <laughs> I really. <What> happened? <laughs> I'm sorry to take you. I shouldn't have been taking you. I should have taken so much of your time. You've got a lot of work to do by the sound of it. <laughs> there you are. That's right. Yes. Well, I should get to bed. So I okay. Get, you get a good night's sleep and get right onto that. Then. Um, thank you so much for the time. I really, it's been fascinating I'm happy, and happy to do it. A, a great journey for me, and um, I hope we can meet again sometime in the future. Maybe on Second Life or somewhere else. Maybe at a Absolutely. conference. <laughs> It's much easier than getting on an airplane. <laughs> it certainly uh, is. And in fact, I've, I've been meaning to try and, and I've been talking to various colleagues about, um, you know, trying to organize actually more sort of anthropology events in places like Second Life because um, if we really care about climate change, um, you know, all the flying that we do everywhere is, is not the best solution to that. And, then, and an avatar does use energy. Second Life uses energy, but it's basically like 1% of what getting on a plane. And I think these kinds of environments have the potential for stuff that can be really a lot more interesting than just Skype or uh, YouTube or something, because you can sort of interact with people in the space. So hopefully we'll do more events um, in these virtual worlds in the future. Right. Well, thanks again for your time, um, and we'll chat soon. You're more than welcome. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and feel free to check out my house and check out Second Life. I'm sure we'll find different times to hang out. <laughs> thanks, Tom. Appreciate that. See you later.